it's, as we have seen, it's not only about uh, the sustainability of uh, the shipping sector, it's about fundamental human rights. Um, uh, we're running out of time. I would like to ask uh, uh, from the panel to um, a question. Uh, only 40 seconds each, if possible, <laughs> to pass the floor to the audience. Um, as regards your topic, how uh, could the EU or the Greek authorities contribute uh, to greener, uh, greener life cycle management of ships? To some extent, we would say that the EU has already opened the path and already supports the shipping industry. The support is twofold. First of all, is the regulatory context that uh, should be there, should be solid, in order to have the directives and the regulations in place, reinstating the message coming from the IMO and from certain environmental priorities that are high on the agenda at the moment. But on the financial side as well, um, the message is clear. Uh, let us have the access to the budget under the Connecting Europe facility at the moment to give the incentive to the early adopters in the shipping industry to have this opportunity, this great opportunity, in transforming Eastern Mediterranean region in a high potential region with uh, sustainability in maritime operation and shipping, especially in short sea shipping. Um, thank you. It was only for one minute. Uh, the emphasis here this morning has been on ports, and ports sit at the, uh, the interface between land and sea, and particularly what we were talking about in our presentation was uh, Cold Darling were actually plugging the ship into the uh, shore-based infrastructure. I think that the European Commission and the regulators need to know on the left hand and the right hand what the, the land hand and the sea hand are doing so that they actually work together. We have the classic case of well, this wasn't happening, but one of the questions that uh, we encourage people to use uh, cold ironing, but then we go and tax them. So we need to make quite sure that the regulation and the frameworks are, are all aligned and from the land-based and from the sea-based. Yeah, I think I've uh, already mentioned most of the points, so I'll just briefly summarise. I think it's... a uh, three um, elements, um, how uh, the European Union um, could uh, promote uh, the greening of life cycle when it comes to ship recycling. The first thing is to um, um, speedily um, come up with uh, this European list of uh, um, ship recycling facilities uh, which have to be uh, certified and audited and which can serve as a reference for um, uh, the shipping industry for clean and safe ship recycling. Um, I have mentioned the debate about uh, further instruments to incentivize clean and safe ship recycling, so to um, make sure that this debate advances. Um, and the third point is to also take into consideration that ship recycling can also be an attractive industry within Europe and to um, find ways to promote this, to engage with stakeholders, and, um, yeah, and to, to see what um, the ship recycling industry in Europe also needs from uh, the authorities, from the governments, and from the European Union in order to, to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Sotis, and to be, uh, to be brief. Um, like I showed in my presentation, there is for a first uh, hybrid sailing vessel a gap, which is about 4.5 million euros for a first prototype uh, for the rig and, and everything. Uh, the European Union and we as taxpaying uh, citizens, citizens have managed to uh, eject the sale project, so a lot of R&D is done. So uh, I would strongly advocate for the European Union as a whole, or European Commission, or people in the audiences, and particularly also ports, to view this as a possibility. Also to put a kind of a green beacon for an industry that is struggling with its image right now as a cleaner transport mount, to put some positive examples forward and to make ports like blue growth hubs, and particularly maybe the ports I mentioned, maybe Portuguese or uh, Spanish or, or maybe Dutch ports, Belgian ports, to be the first in this development and to eject hybrid shipping as one of the options to green the life cycle of ships. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, the audience now if you have any questions. Are you sure? Uh, my name is Sarah Held. I come from the IT 
Clean Shipping Index, Clean Shipping Network. My first question was to, um, uh, which case then? Where did you go? Miss Kovartari? Uh, Sorry if I pronounced it wrong. Um, uh, when I attended an, an, a conference in 2009, uh, the two things you have been talking here about uh, was uh, really in the focus, and this was uh, what was going to save us all in the shipping industry. It was LNG and it was onshore power supply, or cold ironing. Um, at that time they discussed at length uh, the methane slip, that when you bunker the fuel LNG then uh, you release a lot of uh, methane, and that methane is such a strong uh, climate gas that uh, the uh, there is no point in switching over. That was the message at that time. Uh, you didn't mention it in your barriers, so that's why I'm interested in hearing uh, the solutions on this side. Um, I would also like to ask uh, about, uh, let's see, no, start with a question, sorry. Thank you, this is a very good question, in fact. Uh, in a presentation with a duration of 10 minutes, we wouldn't be able to extend so much on this technical side of things, but uh, you are right. Uh, Poseidon met as a project, and LNG is a fuel, because this is your question, and the deployment in the marine industry is a very bold endeavor. We do not say that uh, it's a panacea or it is a solution that will fit. Uh, all the trades and all the ship routes and all the ship profiles. It will highly depend on the operating profile of the vessel and yes, we have recognized that there are many, many safety features that need to be closely looked at. This is why in the short description I made under the activities of the project, there is a specific one looking at the regulatory framework. Currently, we are compiling all the legislations available, best practices, standards, uh, on the LNG deployment in certain other areas. So, uh, and this combined with the IGF code that is being finalized at the moment and based on a risk based approach. So, uh, this is a whole analysis that is going to be made in order to tackle in a sufficient way, uh, sufficient way these technical challenges. Because, above all, uh, there is an environmental equilibrium and the health of the population in the coastal areas that we are really focusing on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then the second question. Uh, at that time they talked about the first was the LNG and then you would mo move over into biogas. Uh, is that part of the Poseidon Med uh, project as well? At the moment it is not, uh, uh, to my extent of the knowledge at least. Uh, Poseidon Med comprises of two phases. The first will be a study uh, that will be uh, submitted towards the end of 2015. This will be a feasibility study, so uh, examining all the aspects on the demand and supply side. And then uh, throughout five years, until 2020, we need to inform and we want to inform all the stakeholders throughout all these activities that I have mentioned in my presentation about the technical, the financial, the safety issues around the deployment of LNG. Uh, and then allow even for some works in the retrofits uh, of some vessels because the Mediterranean Sea Basin is a very, uh, and it has a very high interest because of the short sea shipping. And if we want to talk for Greece as well, it's an archipelagic state. It's uh, a unique uh, case globally. So uh, there is a need for interoperability and interconnection in remote areas. All these aspects connect with each other, so they are going to be looked at under a holistic context. Thank you. I'm Rima Vizgarcin, I'm from Clyde University, it is in Lithuania. Uh, to the same speaker, <laughs> uh, you mentioned about the shipyard preparedness for retrofit orders. What do you mean? What shipyard, uh, shipyards have to do? One of the objectives of the, of the project is uh, try to, su to support the shipyards. We know that uh, the, we do have a problem in Greece in terms of ship preparedness. We do have an issue in Eastern Mediterranean in shipbuilding activity in retrofitting. Uh, the project will, of course, look at uh, providing some awareness, some training, and some uh, 
technical supports to the CPS because if we are talking about words about real LNG retrofits on board the vessels, we should really be in a position to have the plans ready from the owner side, but on the shipbuilding side as well, have everything ready for such a retrofit to take place because this is a massive investment, not only in terms of financials, but before in terms of um, technical considerations and uh, safety features.
itself is not having this long-term vision in its business model interpreted. Maybe in some sectors like oil and gas it is, so it's easier there. Maybe in the local and, and short-term market it is, but not everywhere. So in my mind, this comes back as a problem in all of your IDs. I mean, cold iron is also a costly thing to implement on your ship. If you only come to Athens or Piraeus once in a number of time, how do we use, how do we take up the barrier? Sorry to speak again, but my opinion after 16 years is very short. I heard last week some revolution happened in the IMO, which is highly needed. To give you a personal holistic view, I think the legislation from the main regulators in the maritime industries is laggingly, lagging behind massively in a scandalous way. That the legislation is behind what's achievable in the industry itself, te technically spoken. We're here in a European framework. Europe has shown, for example, in terms of ship waste, when I started out, not to create a black picture, but a hopeful one. We've had 30 or 40 years of marble policy of decreasing ship waste. It hasn't helped much, I can tell you. By the time I started at the Port of Rotterdam, 7% of all ships delivered their waste. Thanks to a European directive, this amount has now become 10 times higher. And there's still waste in the oceans, yes, and a lot of people are doing valuable work on that. But the European Union has now shown in the past that it can make a difference with smart legislation and projects. And I think in either of those projects, it's a question of, I'm, I'm blaming the IMO now, we're all part of more or less also, that the European Union, and maybe looking at the United States a little bit more in some areas, which you can criticize but has also done major step forward to act more and more as an innovative uh, pressure cooker of ideas with the Euros requested and to show that it actually can be done. So how to make it feasible to put, again to say, sorry to say, European tax money in smart projects where you can show that there are alternatives and by that bypass route try to change the IMO policy which is lagging behind in a scandalous way if you see what's achievable in emission reductions of NOx. We saw a coalition stopping that, actually international agreements being made just wiped off the table. And I think the European Union should more and more be a, a, a living lab of what is possible and uh, then try to change the policy direction of the industry and find smart market solutions and uh, put uh, our money where our mouth is. In the back. Thank you. Um, John Max um, from Caesar Biscuit Brussels and the Clean Shipping Coalition. Um, I, I'd like to just return to the LNG issue um, for a moment, if that's possible. Um, I mean, I don't think anybody doubts that climate change is, um, is the, the biggest issue um, that we're facing at the moment. Um, and it's far from clear um, that LNG has really anything to contribute. Um, to that um, fight at all. Um, certainly, methane was missing out from your presentation, um, but you championed the CO2 gains um, from the use of LNG. Um, I think when methane is taken into account, it's far from clear whether or not um, uh, the use of LNG has, has any um, significant contribution to make to fighting um, the problem of climate change. Um, and, um, and I'm wondering, um, I mean, what you're describing um, if LNG is to be used um, more widely is the creation of a whole new infrastructure um, to provide another fossil fuel to the shipping industry. Um, and we know um, how big um, the challenge is um, for tackling climate change. We know what the projections are for um, increasing greenhouse gas emissions from shipping. Um, the reality is, in the long term, we have to decarbonise. Um, and isn't it slightly odd and indeed uh, rather unhelpful um, to be shifting the industry to another fossil fuel, one where you know, large sums of money have been invested in a, in a whole new infrastructure to supply it, thereby you know, in all likelihood um, you know, locking that in. Um, and if I might you know, connect that presentation with, with the presentation from Edo, um, you know, perhaps this is a question to the, to the whole of the panel, I guess, um, perhaps it would be better to be looking at ways of channeling the money that you're going to spend on energy infrastructure into genuine renewables, where, you know, which, which at the end of the day, if climate change is to be tackled, this is where the money has to go. Um, it's no good switching between fossil fuels. You've got to think of whole new paradigms for how shipping is going to operate in the 
for the strongly opinionated uh, thesis you have. It was very, uh, very good indeed. Um, I don't know whether the, the, we had the wrong message conveyed to you before. We do champion LNG as an option, as not the only option. European Union, of course climate change is uh, at the top of the agenda at the IMO, at the European Union. We know there is a roadmap for an 80% reduction in emissions until 2050. And this is very, very challenging at the moment. So we are not talking about only another fossil fuel. You talked about uh, decarbonization, which is another option. At the moment, at the European refineries, they do not have the economic incentives for uh, making a high, high fuel oil from 3.5% to a low sulfur fuel of 0.1% for the ECA zones. This is the financial situation in the Europe at the moment, so European refineries do not have the economic incentives in continuing in the next decades doing so. So we should really explore, we think, another options as well and keep all the options open in order to make some future decisions which are going to be sound financially, environmentally, and most of all technically. Also, LNG may not be the best solution for deep sea shipping, but it could be a very viable option for short sea shipping, and especially when we're talking for Greece, for Cyprus, for ports that are heavily, heavily, their economies are heavily dependent on cruise and tourism and short sea shipping, and we know that there are many, many vessels that are going to be scrapped in the next years. We are going to have some uh, tonnage replacement, in terms of infrastructure, as you say, yes, we need to, this is an aspect we cannot, um, we need to put our focus on, again, but it is not the only solution we say. It is, of course, one solution, and we should be in the place to provide as much information as possible to the stakeholders, to the shipping companies, and to the competent authorities, and to the ministries. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, I'd like uh, to thank you all uh, for your uh, attention and uh, your participation.